the rise and fall of television, television ratings. ratings. Hey everyone, thanks for joining again for this installment of the rise and fall of television ratings. Before we start, please hit that subscribe button for more television ratings and other media critiquing content. Last time we did a quick flyover of the years 1950 to 1975 and the number one show of each year. We saw how CBS reigned king of television for 25 years. However, something scary loomed. A new generation. generation. It seems every generation despises the generation to come after it. I mean, we don't look too highly upon the racism of the greatest generation today. The greatest generation didn't care much for those dirty hippie baby boomers and their desire for revolution. And those retiring baby boomers don't care too much for us millennials. Millennials are afraid of how the plugged-in generation is going to turn out. Seems like I missed a generation. Oh well. And in 1975, as those hippies took showers and stopped having free love for long enough to get a job, they began to enter the workforce and began creating television shows. Happy Days was the start of a new era. While CBS had reinvented itself with more urban properties, it seemed to have forgotten one key point. Young people. Where are the young people at? However, ABC had kind of always been the young people's network. They started with the Lone Ranger in the 50s and had eventually branched into the Partridge Family and the Brady Bunch on Fridays in the 60s. They grew along with their original audience, and the next logical step was a serialized teenage dating comedy set in the early 70s. Can we talk? And once that show added a live audience, Come on, Pats, you can drive my car. I'll let you play with my fuzzy dice. It grew exponentially. It seemed audiences loved hearing people scream after the fond, get excited about romances of its main characters. Audience involvement became the new way to engage a young audience, and they ate it up. They ate it up right through three spin-offs, and a, a kind of spin-off. I mean, Three's Company is really just a raunchier Happy Days, right? Throughout the next three years, Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley were the number one and number two shows of the year. Until Happy Days literally jumped the shark and 60 Minutes took over the number one spot for a time. At this point, the national mood became a bit more somber, dramatic, and wistful in a hope of a more prosperous time. Which led to Dallas and a lot of other ostentatious soap operas of the early 80s. But it was Dallas that shot for the moon. Its 27 million viewers became a huge new benchmark, wonka vadering past any number that had previously been reached by any television program. In the next couple of years, Dallas came back down to Earth, which meant it came back down to 20 million viewers, which was still a massive number. And at this point, comedy was thought to be dead. Audiences had really seen everything on television. There had been a huge amount of comedies on in the 70s as Norman Lear had pushed the envelope about as far as he could with the likes of One Day at a Time, Maude, The Jeffersons, All in the Family, all those classic shows. All attempts at comedy were met with a resounding thud. It was time for comedy to reinvent itself. And then the venereal Bill Cosby happened. The Cosby Show was a bit of a reinvention in that it starred a black family that was not some form of a stereotype. But it still met that traditional comedy mold. And it became the second television comedy to remain at number one for five seasons. It also shot through the moon, opening well in its first season, its second, third, and fourth seasons were crazy high. Although there was some debate here as to how high the ratings really were because Nielsen then changed its practices and there's a whole documentary on it. Um, we can get into that later. It also brought with it a resurgence of comedy, especially family comedy. Family Ties, Who's the Boss, The Wonder Years, Roseanne, all became popular in primetime as a direct result of The Cosby Show's unlikely growth. Also, a few more adult comedies began to become huge along with it. The Golden Girls, Cheers, and Seinfeld all reaped the benefits of a very strong NBC. As the years went on, NBC faded a little bit. The Cosby Show fell from its number one perch 
and Cheers became the number one program on Thursday. As this happened, 60 Minutes took the number one slot while NBC and ABC were fighting it out with their comedies. But by 1996, NBC had the top six shows on network television, and the majority of them aired on Thursday in the now-branded must-see TV lineup. But all good things must come to an end, and must-see TV faded to a new horror. 1999 on Thursday brought us the first season of Survivor, and the television landscape has never really been quite the same. Competing against Friends and the must-see TV lineup, Survivor first went crazy, then CSI took over for a couple of years just to hold the place for the Death Star. With American Idol, we reach the zenith of television history. It's all downhill from here, folks. And that can be the end of this segment. Another couple weeks from now, we will discuss the rise of reality TV and the fall of traditional linear television. Don't forget to send me suggestions of television shows or specific years you would like for me to highlight. Also, check out my Facebook in the link in the doobly-doo and follow me on Twitter at NotYourNormalG1. Vote for our favorite Disney movie bracket by going to my Facebook page. I hope you liked this little video. I can't wait to dive deeper still with you. Like, subscribe, and share. I need your help to send subscribers and your shares do the trick to get the word out to more people. See you again next week on Tuesday at 4 o'clock.